It's March of 1918. The First World War has raged on for over three years. Trenches in Flanders remain a gridlocked network of mud and blood, while in Russia, the people have overthrown their government after three years of suffering. In the Middle East, Britain has captured cities they've only heard about in the Bible. And in Africa, Germany continues to outwit its foes in a legendary guerrilla campaign to save its colonies. With fighting forever raging across the old world, it may be surprising that some countries stayed neutral for either part or all of the war. This was not for lack of coaxing by both sides to bring them in. Both alliance blocs thought that the next small country they bribed to their side would be the one, and then the next one, and then the next one that would tip the balance. For those who had sat out of the initial death struggle between Britain, France, Germany, and Austria-Hungary, there certainly were opportunities if they joined. For instance, Romania and Bulgaria, two bordering Balkan countries with scores to settle, ended up joining opposite sides, seeing the war as a great opportunity to get even while being backed up by bigger powers. On the other hand, states like Spain, Sweden, and initially America saw that staying out of the war came with the valuable opportunities to trade with and loan money to the side of their choice. And finally, there were some countries that bordered on the front lines that were forced into neutrality as a matter of national survival. Enter the Netherlands. <laughs> maritime country sitting square across from England and adjacent to Germany, which in 1914 had a population of 6 million. Despite being surrounded by the warring powers for the duration of the conflict, Holland had managed to remain neutral throughout the war through its policy of armed neutrality. And this was challenged from the very opening days of the campaign. Dutch forces blocked the roads leading into its country so that German units seeking to go around Belgian defenses would not be able to do so simply by going through the Netherlands the same way you might cut across the grass in high school to get to the next sidewalk. And, as a matter of fact, according to pre-war German plans, the Netherlands was only safe to be trampled like grass by the timely fall of Belgium's great fortress at Liège. Plans have been made by Germany to go around the powerful Belgian fortress through the Netherlands should the fortress have not been taken quickly. But, lucky for the Netherlands at least, it did. As the war progressed beyond its opening phase, the Netherlands became a recipient of the many refugees who were fleeing the fighting. Over one million Belgians fled to Holland, or one in six Belgians living in the country before the war. These refugees naturally had to be looked out for and cared for, in a country whose population had just swollen by 20%. In the meantime, the trenches began to be dug in the west and front lines solidified. And yet, being so close to the front lines, Holland's neutrality was relatively secure from violation by either side, for differing reasons. For the Central Powers, Germany, Austria, and the Ottoman Empire, Holland became critical as a lifeline to the outside world. Goods, and especially food, imported to the Netherlands could be subsequently traded to Germany, a crucial supply conduit made possible only by Holland's neutrality. As for the Entente, Britain, France, Russia, Holland's neutrality kept the country's series of North Sea and Channel ports out of the hands of the German Navy and its submarines from which it could expand its commerce rating and mining activities in the English Channel, and perhaps most importantly of all, cut the supply lines between Britain and France. Still, despite it being in each side's tentative interest to keep the country neutral, Holland could not afford to let its army go home. It had to be ready at any moment to fight for its neutrality. And in case the Netherlands getting invaded sounds far-fetched, it's worth noting that violations of its neutrality did occur, even after the war stopped moving in the West. Soldiers strayed across its borders, Dutch shipping was harassed at times, and even accidental aerial bombardments of the Netherlands occurred by pilots of both sides. However, it wasn't until the United States entered the war in 1917 that the situation became critical. Until that point, the U.S. had been the champion of the rights of neutral states, being neutral itself. However, when the United States decided to step up the sidelines and throw in with the Entente, things changed. It quickly became apparent that the U.S. was no longer the champion of neutral rights. Indeed, the U.S. began using heavy-handed tactics against the countries trading with its newly minted enemy, Germany, which, as discussed, was something the Netherlands was indeed doing, which it had a right to do. It's important now to talk about a theater that tends to get a lot more attention in the next war, World War II, especially with World War I's memory being dominated by the image of trench lines on the Western Front. That is, the Commerce War. Getting men and supplies overseas was critical to each side, 
as big empires over big oceans meant a constant stream of everything was needed everywhere at once, just for battle to happen at a faraway land. Knowing this, each side quickly developed ways and its own methods for harassing the shipping of the other side. For the Entente, it was fairly straightforward. With their superior fleet strength, based on the British Navy, they had maintained a strict naval blockade on the Central Powers, not only preventing Germany and her allies from reinforcing their overseas holdings, but, more critically, it prevented Germany and her allies from trading with neutral nations, which, again, was perfectly within the right of those neutral countries. In an attempt to appease these neutral countries being denied their freedom of commerce, Britain, upon stopping a ship, would purchase the entire cargo of a ship headed for Germany, before sending it on its way. Other tactics include ordering neutral countries not to resell any cargo labeled as war contraband to central powers, while being perfectly willing to trade within it themselves. This, of course, included things like guns and munitions, but it also included things like food. By denying the central powers access to the neutral markets of the world, Britain's plan was to starve the enemy population into submission. Their strategy proved quite effective. Rationing was introduced by the central powers, initially voluntarily, and then compulsorily, in the first half of the war. By 1918, tens of thousands of soldiers and civilians alike across Central Europe were perishing from starvation and related disease. The blockade brought the war home to many of them in ways that civilians and allied powers simply could not understand. It truly felt like they were being surrounded and starved, sieged inside the castle of their country. More civilians died from the blockade continuing after the armistice was signed than the much more publicized civilian deaths during Germany's initial campaigns into poor little Belgium. But Britain's war of starvation was not without enemy response, perhaps the more famous of the two methods of commerce warfare. This commerce raiding by the Central Powers was initially performed by surface ships, and later submarines. The idea was to seize and sink ships that were trading with the Allied Powers, notably Britain, who herself was heavily reliant on overseas imports to feed her populace. And indeed, the Central Powers tactics began to work out after several years. The commerce raiding and the destruction it caused began to tell. In 1917, where more shipping was sunk than the rest of the war combined, over 3,700 ships were lost on the Entente side, largely in the Atlantic, but also in the incredibly successful Mediterranean theater, where German and Austro-Hungarian submarines preyed on long Entente supply lines to their colonial holdings and theaters. Britain was finally forced to join their enemy in initiating rationing, starting early in 1918 in London, before spreading nationwide in the summer of that year. In France, price controls on grain were introduced in 1915, extending to other commodities the following year. And Russia, who had the grain to sell, simply could not get it out, and had its own problems importing arms and armaments from its allies. As shipping losses began to pile up on the Bali Ocean, and more and more dockyard space was being dedicated to replacing lost merchant ships, Britain began to look at other means of replenishing its losses. This need was made all the more urgent by the recent surrender of Russia and the releasing of millions of German troops to be able to fight on the Western Front. And in this time of the Allies' crisis, it just so happened that there was a small, neutral country just across the Channel with a large merchant fleet. Holland. With close to a million and a half tons of shipping, Holland's merchant marine was a tempting target to Allied governments desperately seeking to make good their losses. Negotiations were started initially for preferential trading terms with Holland, but Holland stubbornly refused any Allied attempts for special treatment. Tensions between the Entente and Holland began to heat up. The Entente started to ban critical fertilizer and grain exports to Holland, with the continued fear of Germany feeding herself on Dutch food. Never mind that the Dutch needed such imports to feed themselves. Later, Dutch ships were denied even cold refuel, causing many Dutch ships to become stranded overseas in Allied ports. This heavy-handedness was justified by the Entente by the recent disasters in their own camp, who were genuinely scared that they might lose the war. The collapse of Russia and the continued predation of German and Austro-Hungarian submarines David Lloyd George, Prime Minister of Great Britain, said that the only thing that could snatch victory away from the Allies was lack of shipping. Finally, in March of 1918, with the U.S. now involved in negotiation, things came to a head. The U.S. demanded that Holland use its ships to transport American men and war material across hostile waters to Europe, and talks began to really break down. The Dutch balked at what would have been a blatant violation of their neutral rights. Even had they been willing, Germany and her allies would have had to agree to any arrangement due to Holland's neutral status, something that the enemy power is quite unlikely to do. 
It was then that the Entente simply decided to seize all vessels of Dutch registry sitting in their ports for the war effort. This requisition was announced in America through President Wilson's issuing of Proclamation 1436, which is dated March 20, 1918. It reads in part, Now, therefore I, Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States of America, do hereby find and proclaim that the imperative military needs in the United States require the immediate utilization of vessels of Netherlands Registry, now lying within the territorial waters of the United States. And I do therefore authorize and empower the Secretary of the Navy to take on behalf of the United States the possession of and employ all such vessels of the Netherlands Registry, as might be necessary for the essential purposes connected with the prosecution of the war against the Imperial German government. In total, 90 Dutch flag merchant ships in America and 45 in port in Britain were confiscated. In an attempt to justify this to their people and, more importantly, international opinion, Britain and America claimed the medieval right of angry, which says they may essentially seize anything they want for the prosecution of the war effort. Response in the Netherlands was indeed angry, immediate, and furious. The Queen of the Netherlands, Queen Wilhelmina, demanded that the government issue an ultimatum to the Entente to return the ships, or the Netherlands would join the Central Powers. She was only barely talked out of such a course of action by her ministers. Protests flooded the country, including a march taking place in front of the American embassy, shouting jeers at those inside, and singing patriotic songs. Newspapers railed against the hostile treatment by the so-called liberal democracies. But, ultimately, given the Netherlands' precarious situation between a rock and a hard place, the only official response that came was an official complaint. But, of course, that was not the only fallout from the seizure. For those who still stood on the sidelines, and certainly for her enemies, the Entente's claims of moral superiority in the conflict had suffered a serious blow. Many saw the requisitioning as a little more than blatant theft of neutral property, thinly veneered over with archaic justification. As for the Entente's enemies, the requisitioning of Dutch shipping was protested with equal fur, with Germany demanding that it receive an equal concession from the Netherlands. Their protest became especially urgent when it seemed like the Dutch's relatively muted response was quite unneutral behavior. This German indignance provoked yet another international affair, with the Dutch at its center, termed the Sand and Gravel Crisis. Earlier in the war, Germany had made a deal with Holland, wherein it could transfer sand and gravel through the Netherlands rail lines. This was to be used strictly for purposes not related to the war, such as for road repair. However, much of this material began to be used to construct frontline fortifications. And now, the Germans wanted more. Spearheaded by General Ludendorff, the Germans now demanded that Dutch rail lines be allowed to transport troops and supplies to the front, just like the seized Dutch ships would now be transporting troops and supplies for the Entente. Unfortunately for the Netherlands, the leverage they had once had over Germany through its trade had been reduced by its own shortages after four long years of war and allied blockades on its trade. It seemed that after three years of neutrality, the Netherlands may finally be forced to step off the sidelines. Salvation appeared just in time, for the German spring offensive failed. It turned out to be their last offensive. No longer with the urgent need to throw troops into France, the Dutch were able to compromise with the Germans with a single concession. The Germans would now be able to transport additional grain and timber on Dutch rail. Once again, the danger of war had been averted. But there was one last threat to the small maritime country, one that they did not even know about during the war, and this time it was from England. Little did Holland know that the British were considering invading the country by the sea in the summer of 1918, during their own final offensive. The logic was, with the Germans in full retreat, they would not be able to defend the Netherlands should the British invade to get around their flank. Holland was only spared the humiliation and destruction of an invasion by the British Navy's reluctance to patrol the additional stretch of Dutch coast that they would then be occupying. And then, as suddenly as it began, the war was over. The armistice was signed in November of 1918, less than eight months after the shipping crisis. The Netherlands had survived 1918 and the war. But its neutrality, and the concept of neutral states in general, had been severely damaged by both sides. In their own ways, both the Entente and the Central Powers operated under the assumption that might makes right. Of course, dressed up in the ill-fitting clothes of making the world safer democracy and self-defense from the vengeful old order, respectively. If one was a small country, you simply had to choose which narrative to believe. And this was after Britain. The combatant who had done so much to shape the story of the war in the English-speaking world, to their benefit, had entered the war in the name of defending the Netherlands' neutral neighbor, Belgium. This ignoring of the rights of neutrals, and the using of them as pawns and trading cards in the international framework, 
would ultimately lay the precedent for the ultimate shattering of the rights of neutrals in the Second World War. In that war, everyone would be combatant, whether they wanted to be or not. And in that war, the Netherlands' neutrality would not even be pretended to be honored.